Good afternoon, Lisa Homa here. Hope you're all having a great day. Today, we're gonna to talk about leadership policy and regulatory trends. We're gonna to be touching upon leadership policies and also in week three, so we'll hit some of those. But the biggest thing we're gonna be talking about today is decision-making. And you think, wow, wow, that's pretty boring. That's just as bad as leadership policy and regulatory trends. It kind of is, but it is the foundation of everything you're going to do as a nurse leader, and most especially, it is a foundation for becoming a nurse researcher. Whew, we got deep really quick, so here we go. Objectives for this lecture are to discuss the economic trends that impact the nursing profession and to formulate a plan so we can work on growing and developing you into a holistic practitioner of nursing. On to chapter one, this is on decision making. And I just wanna mention this is the only lecture where I'm gonna be going chapter by chapter to go through things. The rest of our lectures in leadership, we've gone off the grid. We've lost our minds and gone off the grid. And the reason this is so important is because there are so many aspects in nursing leadership that are not covered in the textbook. And they're all things that will get you into trouble as a nurse. And we felt it was important to, of course, follow the BSN essentials, but also to formulate all this research that we've learned over the years to help give you the tools and the strategies they, that you need to become an effective nurse leader. So what's the difference between making a decision and solving a problem? Essentially, decision-making is triggered by a problem. It's a complex cognitive process defined as choosing a particular course of action, not so different than problem solving. And it's handled in a way that does not focus on eliminating the underlying problem or the root cause, if that is terminology you are familiar with. Problem solving, rather, is always includes a decision-making step. And we're gonna talk about several methods or models to help you formulate and solve problems. Also, the attempt to identify the root problem in the situation. My personal opinion on this is that problem solving is the way to go. You have to understand the problem solving mechanisms first before you can make a decision. So if I had to put these on a hierarchy, problem solving would be at the top, followed by critically thinking your way through the process, and then finally having enough data to formulate or make a decision. And then critical thinking is something we talk about I feel like it's so immersed in nursing. The problem with it is there's almost no research that can tell us how we can teach critical thinking to nurses. It's extremely challenging. The research shows us on the cognitive, the metacognition that goes along the underlying processes, but unfortunately, we do not understand the mechanism that translates to critical thinking yet. The first thing is it involves reflecting, and I hope when you see this, this is going to connect you why all these assignments you do now in nursing are stinking self-reflections. You're probably so sick of it, but we have found reflection is one of the components that leads to critical thinking. So that's explained some of your learning activities. Drive meaning. We're always asking you, in addition to formulating or supporting your opinions with evidence, we also want you to derive meaning from it. Meaning, what does that now mean to you? Now that you were presented with this evidence, how will this change the way you practice? We want you to examine evidence and reasoning and then form conclusions about facts. So there's a lot of people that just say, well, you can't assume anything. So a scholarly way of assuming something is to collect all your data and then after looking and reviewing everything, then you start to form a research Researcher calls this a conclusion. Based on everything we know, this is where we are today and what we believe. So thinking, hmm, heuristics. Heuristics is a use of trial and error methods or a rule of thumb approach to problem solving rather than setting rules. And why do you care about this? Okay, because one of the things we're gonna be talking about a little further down the road here in the presentation, we're gonna be talking about intuition. So heuristics are part of the decision-making in intuition. They are basically mental shortcuts, not meant to provide a perfect solution or optimal problem solving, but they can provide you with immediate solutions under the fly to help you solve something. And it's a structured approach, applying a theoretical model in a problem solving or decision-making type area. Traditional problem solving process. One, you have to identify the problem and you think that's the easiest step and sometimes you don't know why it is. Why is it that my nurses are not putting on a fall precaution band? 
And you think that's easy because the nurses just need to be compliant and put on the fall precaution band. It is not that easy. Maybe the fall precaution bands, maybe you're always running out of supply and there aren't any. Maybe they're listed, they're on the other side of the unit that nurses have to badge in somewhere to get it out. It's never as easy as you think it is. All these issues, especially in a healthcare facility, are complex. It's not an easy fix. So one, identify the problem. Two, gather data to analyze the causes. So you want to validate that the problem is what you think it is and use some form of metric to show that what your hunch or somebody else's hunch is actually verified. So then you wanna gather the possible causes if you're not sure what that is. You wanna explore alter alternative solutions, evaluate the alternative, so evaluate which thing do you think could potentially be a, a viable solution and something you can implement. There could be the best computer system in the world and it's a million dollars, but if you don't have a million dollars in your budget, guess what? That solution is off the table. So you have to find things that are feasible, reasonable, and they, they fit the budget. Then you want to select the appropriate solution, again, based on understanding your budget and other possible constraints, and you want to try to implement it. Implementing things is not easy either. Some people also call this in healthcare operationalizing something, and that's just putting what you did into place. That's not easy. Um, evaluation is you just want to look after you've implemented it, how did your project turn out? Did it go the way you thought? Or sometimes it can actually make the problem worse. A managerial decision-making process. So it's not that different. And if you're going to notice a common theme is they're all very similar. And that is really the point of me showing you all of these things. A manager makes decisions. So you want to understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. You want to research your potential options. You want to compare and contrast these options because any decision you make as a manager, it's your butt. Literally, there is some risk involved no matter what you do, but you want to Make as educated as a decision as you can. Then obviously make the decision, find a way to implement it, and then evaluate your results. Here's the nursing process, which we've had our entire life. The abbreviation or the acronym is ADPI. And the reason I mention this is if you look at all the steps of the nursing process, they are in fact all the same steps that we use in creating a research study. Interesting, right? Also, the same steps that we use in the managerial decision-making and regular problem-solving process. There is a theme. They are all similar. And then integrated ethical problem-solving model. So very similar, again, determine the ethical issue, identify the values, rank the ethical principles. So basically, which ones are most important? You want to rank them at the top. If human life, that would be prioritized at the, at the very top. Safety at the top. Develop an action plan consistent with your ethical priorities. Implement and then again reflect, or the other word we see in the other models is evaluate. And then here's the intuitive decision-making model. And why do I mention the intuitive decision-making model? Have you ever used your gut to take a strategic action that impacts patient outcomes? You didn't know what was going on with the patient, but you made the decision. And when somebody asked you, why'd you do it? You made it by your gut. And so me as a nurse working in ICU for a long time, I've always worried about, I've lived half my career on gut decisions and I've always worried about them. But the good news is I'm sharing what the research says about them. The combination, it's so it's a way of you knowing based on information processing and intuition together with clinical decision making. When you combine all of those elements, nurses actually achieve excellent clinical decision making. It is called recognition prime decision model for intuition decision making. People are found to make very effective decisions under time and pressure using the intuition model. So if when in doubt, if your gut is telling you to do it, then do it. So critical elements in problem solving and decision making. Again, very similar process. The reason I mention it is you want to define your objectives clearly, gather data carefully. If you gather terrible data, if it's, if it's not formulated in evidence, if you're using old sources, you get what you get. And then take the necessary time. I feel like everything in healthcare, there's no time to make anything. Take the time that you can given the circumstances because unfortunately, time is just something we don't have in healthcare most of the time. Very similar, look at alternatives, think logically, choose and act decisively. And then strategies for promoting evidence-based practice. 
So you may be thinking, I don't care about evidence-based practice, but you have to. There's new payment models that hospitals are getting paid and they are based on outcomes. If we don't support our practice with evidence, then our hospitals don't get paid and guess what? We don't have a job. So it is important for us to use evidence for many reasons. The value of going to a conference or reading a nursing journal or something outside of work is to keep you abreast of the, the latest evidence of what's happening. If you find something that is important, like let's say you found that we need to use a certain type of wipe as we're putting in a Foley catheter. I wouldn't just go by one source. I'd use multiple sources of to validate that that is in fact come to the same conclusion after reading multiple sources of evidence. The next thing is to use the evidence not only to support clinical interventions, but to support the teaching strategies. So if you're doing a new practice at the bedside, you also want to be sure that you can teach it appropriately and you want to make sure that you convey the evidence and why this is important to change your practice, right? If you have one, if you have 30 minutes to get in and out of somebody's home or 30 minutes to do X, Y, or Z, you have to be pretty convincing to get that nurse to change their practice to something new that will take them longer and cause them maybe to get home later in the day or whatever that is. The next is to find established sources of evidence in your specialty. So nur nurses should always seek nursing research. I hope you know that. But I will tell you as you move on in your master's program and doctoral programs that you may choose to do research that you have to rely on other disciplines. Unfortunately, nursing research is still new, sort of new. We only started doing our own internal research in nursing over the last 50 years. So there may be things that you're investigating that do not come from the nursing discipline at all. Then implement and evaluate nationally sanctioned clinical practice guidelines. And what I mean by that is, if you want to know about something with people with a kidney failure, you want to go to the National Kidney Foundation. You don't want to just use the American Family Practice Guidelines. You want to use something that is appropriate and follows the discipline or the population that it pertains to. And then always, 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 you're not supposed to say always, but under these circumstances in research, I found it is better, it is safer to be conservative and to question and challenge everything you read. Just because somebody publishes it in a study doesn't mean that the research is not complete crap. Well, that's the one thing I realized in my doctoral program. Once I really started to understand how people supported the recipe they used to do a research study, I saw the worst terrible research ever. And I could talk about this all day and all night. It was fascinating. And these are well-published studies that we have changed practice for, and they are based on crap research. There's no validation. It's terrible research. Unbelievable. Strategies for promoting EBP, we're continuing just with the last things. So dispel myths and traditions. I will say if you're interested in research, my motto has always been paradigms are meant to be broken and this is no different. Just because some big guru did the study and said it can't it can be replicated, you know, this, that, the other thing, it doesn't mean anything. Guess what? You could have easily missed a step in the 42 steps you're doing to do a research study. You could have easily gotten something wrong, which is why replication is so important. If somebody said this is the only way it could be, to me, that should be challenged and you should try to break it. Then collaborate with other nurses locally and globally. Whatever findings you're finding, the most fascinating thing to find that other if you serve, let's say you're on a transplant floor and you're working with transplants patients, it's so interesting to get to a conference where you're with other nurses who deal with that same population and you'll find that there are very common themes across both of your departments or your units that it's just such a fascinating thing. So not only find out how the conditions are for you and all the nurses on your floor and in your health system, but also globally, are they noticing the same or similar trends happening there? You want to interact with other disciplines to bring nursing evidence to the table. And this is also interesting. Again, conferences, some conferences will give you this ability, but um, working on the interprofessional collaborations will give you this. And um, that's really exciting. We'll have opportunities for you to do this throughout the program. And then an administrative model of decision making. So if you haven't already learned this in nursing, Nursing is not black or white. It's We pretty much practice in the gray. An administrative model of decision-making is pretty much the same way. It's about calibrating all the different shades of gray. 
So you want to make decisions that are best. You may only have two decisions and they could be terrible decisions, but you have to be able to pick between the better of the two. Complete knowledge, you may not have a full picture. Be, there may not be a recent study on something for you to formulate your opinion. So things are often fragmented. So you have to, again, make the best decision you can under the circumstances. Usually choose from among alternatives, not all the possible ones. And the final choice is satisfying rather than maximizing. So I hate this because I try to be concise and I find that I want to be as accurate as possible, but sometimes the, the rule of this is do the best you can. So essentially what I'm going to show you are a couple examples of how you can use data to support your decision making. So if you're talking about financials, for example, a payoff table, it shows a cost profit volume relationship. Sometimes it's very helpful for gathering quantitative information um, to help you make a decision. So I'm just pointing these out. They may or may not be helpful. You can use a decision tree. This is why in the clinical arena at the bedside, we have clinical decision trees to help us to understand, okay, I'm at A, how do I get to B? This is a consequence table. Again, this is used more so. It can create a different consequence. So you can list your objectives for solving a problem down one side of the table and rates how each alternative would meet the desired outcome. Program evaluation and review technique is a popular tool to determine the timing of decisions. So if we implement X, Y, or Z, then we understand the, the realistic or feasible rollout to roll out or implement this training or whatever it is you're doing will be October, for example. And then identify characteristics of successful decision makers. We're going to talk more about this in our on-campus lecture, but the first is you want to be a self-aware person. So if someone is, let's say, if you've ever had a performance appraisal and somebody says something completely off the wall and you think, that just can't be me, have you ever had those aha moments where you realize, oh my gosh, maybe that person may be right, or maybe they aren't right, but either way, being self-aware is critically important to improving yourself. Be courageous. Being a manager in a leadership role, you have to be courageous every day, sometimes just downright scary, because your decisions often affect others, and that, to me, that's terrifying. Sensitive, you want to be sensitive, so open-minded. Close-minded gets you nowhere. Be open-minded and try to understand that you're impacting. You want to receive a lot of feedback from a lot of stakeholders before you make a decision. And energetic, uh, you want to show enthusiasm and show momentum as you're building and planning a project. You want to be as creative as you possibly can, and sometimes that means you don't have all the creative skills that you need, so you want to ask somebody else to come in. Use a rational approach to solve problems. Use goals to support your process, and then again, evaluation at the end. On to chapter two. So this pertains to your paper that you're going to be writing this week. And we're just going to hit these really quickly. Common leadership style. So some of these could be revealed in your assessment. So the coach, they create a culture of high performance. They work on collaboration and empowerment and fulfillment. They're underpinned by clear skills, ethics, partnership, and collaboration. Man, everybody wants to work for a coach. I don't know if you've now, when you're going through these, think about great nurse managers you've had or great nurse leaders you work with. If you were lucky enough to do that, I could tell you a lot of bad. I can certainly tell you which ones in here are autocratic. And I know for a fact I've worked for mostly autocratic leaders, which is unfortunate. Look at all these things. Try to think about if you know someone who possesses these types of leadership styles. They believe in potential. They have a whole culture that is, focuses on trust and safety. They work to be intentional and thoughtful. They use powerful questions and active listening feedback as they move. If you were ever able to work for a visionary, wow, you are so fortunate, a nurse leader who's a visionary. They're driven, inspired of what the company would become. They're pretty much focused in the future tense. They don't get bogged down by little details. They're big picture people. Their intent is to just change the world, essentially. They often are sought when the company is experiencing or they're anticipating that they need a complete change. They look for the visionaries to come in and either move them through challenging times or take them to the next level when they know growing pains are coming. These visionaries bring cohesiveness. They inspire everyone. They want everyone to be on the same page. They're often charismatic and they're very determined people. They're 
tough as nails. They have the endurance to keep going through whatever challenges that they come up against. They designate themselves often as the person meant to guide the organizational change. They actually know it. They see where they are positioned and they know it. They move forward willingly. If you are the servant leadership, so I have heard this is the number one leadership type that they want you to be. If you've ever worked for a servant leader, wow, you are lucky. They lead by putting the needs of others first on their team. They believe that when their team members feel personally and professionally fulfilled, they produce higher quality work more efficiently and productively. I will tell you as I'm reading this to you, this is Catherine Kalkaba, our comfort theory. This is what she believes is the model of healthcare to create a healthy work environment. And I 100% believe her. And to drive those changes, I think in her type of institution, if that were your theoretical framework, you'd want a servant leader driving that philosophy home. So employee satisfaction and collaboration are extremely high under these under these influences of these types of leaders. They create an environment where people, your employees feel respected, appreciated, and values. And they, the philosophy tends to have stronger work cultures and higher employee morale and engagement than other cultures. The autocratic leader, wah, wah. This is a terrible one. This is the leader who has complete authoritarian control over a group or an organization. They don't care about input from anyone else. They make their own decisions. They're not collaborators. A dictator is also an autocratic leader. A dictator uses power for oppression rather than pushing a group forward. An autocratic leader wants to push a group forward, but it's at the expense of everyone else. Unfortunately, examples of this are Hitler, Napoleon, and Vladimir Putin. Yuck. Autocratic leaders, I have a few uh, where I am now, I'm just saying, and they're no fun to work with at all. Laissez-faire, it's actually who my, my uh, boss is now. And I thought, oh, it doesn't sound good, but actually it's wonderful to work for a laissez-faire person compared to a micromanager or an autocrat. The attitude of trust, they trust their employees and basically they're hands off unless they need to intervene on your behalf. And the key is, I've seen laissez-faire people, but then they also don't intervene on your behalf. A true laissez-faire person will want to have the employees take the onus. It actually helps you to become a stronger leader because you don't have somebody, you have a little bit of guidance, but not too much. People are expected to solve their own problems. They're expected to use their own resources and creativities to meet their goals. And they take charge when necessary. If I need somebody to escalate, my boss to escalate something forward because somebody's not playing nicely in the sandbox, she will absolutely do that. And I love her. I respect her. And this, when used exactly how on this on the slide, they are amazing leaders. The Democrat leader. This is good. There's a lot of pros and cons to Democratic leaders. They're participatory. They have shared leadership. They're under this type of leadership. Employees are more productive. They're satisfied, innovative. They have less absenteeism and they're a more cohesive group. The disadvantage is that if you need a decision made yesterday to get 25 people on board, it can it could be a long, lengthy process, and that makes it tough. Slower decision making, and then le the leaders feel burdened because if they have to do anything, they have to go through 25 stakeholders to get something done first, which is really, that's tough. The pace setter, this type of leader sets an example of high performance, high pace, and high quality. Team members are expected to follow suit. I think this is really tough. I've seen nurses do this. They fizzle out. For, so in the short term, these people get a lot done, but they burn out their teams in the process of it. You cannot expect people to work as hard as you do. If you're a pace setter, you cannot expect your team to do the same thing. It's just totally unrealistic. A transformational leader is what we talk about in nursing most. That's what they say they want, but actually what we need in nursing are servant leaders. But transformational leaders, they have vision they inspire. That's how they take charge of a group. They have basically a group of committed followers and they will get, they'll seek feedback. They'll take in all those things and they'll work on goals and things like that. They work, this is like the highest collaborative model in my mind. The leader acts in the interest of the followers. So they work as a team approach on just about everything, but the transformational leader is still set apart from the people they work with because they're driving the vision forward. It's like getting a nurse to do nursing research or to publish an article. That one transformational person has the end goal in mind and they get all the other people on the team 
as a unified goal working towards creating the research or whatever they need to do to get published eventually. Transactional leader is a more structured approach to management, relies on rigorous checks and balances. To me, this is the micromanager. Wah, wah, they get the wah, wah award. Employees are given their short and long-term goals expected to work towards their supervision, and that's fine if not used in a dictator-type fashion. Everyone is expected to stick to the strict guidelines set by the company. The employees whose goals are achieved are rewarded, but everybody else who doesn't make their deadline, they get in trouble. This is a wah-wah. And then bureaucratic leaders rely on the clear chain of command, strict regulations and confirmation by its followers. And where do we see this? The government, again, I think they also get a wah wah, except I understand there's a chain of command in the military because they, they save lives. So they follow their things. But if you're not in the military, who wants to work for somebody like this? This would be terrible. It can create confusion between bureaucratic leadership and autocratic leadership. There are some overlaps between the two, but a bureaucratic leader relies more on the entire line of authority, that's the chain of command, the hierarchy, versus an autocratic leader cares only about themselves. Difference between leaders and managers, this is a pet peeve of mine, I've thought historically, you only want leaders, you don't want managers, but you actually want both. You want the people who have vision to be your leader, and you want the managers to do what they do best, which is to manage the day-to-day. So here's a little quick thing on how to differentiate. Leaders inspire change. Managers manage transformation. Leadership requires vision. Management requires tenacity. So they need the guts to be able to carry out whatever it is that the visionaries have created. The managers require specifics, whereas the leader, they just have this imagination and they don't know how it's going to happen. They just know what they want to happen. Leadership requires abstract thinking. Managers require data. Leadership requires ability to articulate. Management requires ability to interpret. A few more differences. Leadership requires aptitude to sell. Management requires aptitude to teach. Leadership understands the external environment. Management requires an understanding of how this will work within the confines of the organization itself. Leadership requires risk-taking. Management requires self-discipline to implement and make sure that those plans are carried out. Leadership requires confidence in the face of uncertainty, and management requires blind commitment to completing the task at hand. Leadership is accountable, so it's their butt if something doesn't go wrong, but management is accountable to the team. Chapter 3. So Elliot and Corey found... In 2018, leadership traits most respected by millennials to own and live the company values, communicate openly and early, inspire people to reach higher. These are the best leaders that they've they have found. They own their mistakes. They recognize big wins, small wins, and hard work. They are they trust people. They make the right decision, not based on popular decisions. They add value to the teams, helping them to be successful. They have the courage to be genuine and visible, and they take care of people. To me, what a leader is is in charge of, what they're supposed to do, is create the environment that their teams are successful, where they can thrive. And this, to me, defines all those leadership traits of what, once a leader creates that environment, the teams are able to do what they need to do. That's all I have. Have a great day.